Good morning. We're so glad you're here this morning. Uh, I'm Kathy Haug, and along with the rest of the teaching team, we are so pumped to be journeying through the book of Exodus together throughout this fall season. And you can see the, the series um, title is Progress, and that is being pulled from one of our key values as a church community for progress over perfection, right? So it's one of several values, but we're really leaning into that in this series. And um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because my husband Chris and I, we just marked our 20th wedding anniversary, 20 years of marriage. And so talk about a work in progress, right? And some imperfections still there that we're working through. Uh, But I remember when we were engaged, uh, folks would come up to us and often try, you know, a cautionary tale, like, oh, be ready. There's going to be a lot of fights in the future. And, and specifically, I don't know why, maybe they were raining on a romance parade, but people would warn about things like, you know, you're going to fight about your toothpaste and whether you roll the tube or you fold the tube. And I remember thinking, like, well, like that's kind of a silly thing to fight about. Like, I, I'm just going to get my own toothpaste. I don't see the problem. Um, But as you can imagine, over two decades of marriage, we found plenty of things, silly and not silly, to fight about. Uh, But it kind of reminded me that, in many ways, it's those everyday little things that we we kind of think there's, you know, there's a right way to do this thing that ends up maybe exposing how we really hold the value of progress over perfection. And so I was thinking about how sometimes this comes out when we say things like, There are two kinds of people in the world, which almost always is going to lead to some kind of gross oversimplification, am I right? But um, the internet is full of commentary about such things. So there are two ways to do things in the world, am I right? There is this way, and there is this way. Now, I'm not, who am I to judge, but of course, when I come to your home, I will make sure it's facing the right way before I leave. Um, You know, our house, this one surprised me. Um, And actually, it kind of drives me bonkers. So there are boxes, and there are boxes you open. And in our household, I often find this happening in my home, even though there are no cool prizes at the bottom of cereal boxes anymore. So I find boxes opened every which way, and I could leave them and consider it good for my character, but I do not. (laughs) Because, you know, the universe needs to be set into balance again. Am I right? Am I right? Okay, so there's a way. And this brings me to maybe my, there are two kinds of people in the world, and it relates to blue tape. Because my friends, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are these kind of people, and there are these kinds of people. (laughs) Right? Now, the fact that I'm doing this demonstration probably helps you to know if you are my kind of people. (laughs) Two kinds of people. Um, But I've been thinking about that this week, right? And the reality is that sometimes it is those little things that make me go, okay, do I really value progress, or am I kind of a perfectionist? You could all probably have some great conversations about your level of perfectionism. Talk about it afterwards. Linger. No, don't linger around your tables because we have to leave. But you know, talk to each other. Um, For example, I was thinking, and let's get real here, how many of us in the last month or so have come in and looked longingly up at these wires disconnected from a projector and thought, how long, oh Lord? Till there is balance in this room. Am I right? Right? Some of us are doing that. Um, I like to think that the Lord is growing my sense of freedom as I embrace being in process and in progress. And never fear. The good people of Third Church are on it. I just want to tell you. They ordered a projector. It came. It didn't work. They sent it back. They're getting another. But soon we will have symmetry again in our CG world. Okay? Um, But again, I thought, are the staff trying to secretly teach me something here, right? Um, Maybe they're trying to help 
everyone every day know life-giving freedom in Jesus somehow using a projector to break me of my need for perfection? Is it possible? Because friends, if we value progress over perfection, if we really believe that, if we believe that God works through people who are in progress, not perfect, then you and I are going to find some unlikely partners, some unlikely people showing up in God's great story of bringing freedom to the world, maybe even some imperfect people like me and like us. So let's go to the book of Exodus. We've got some Bible page numbers, I think, on the screen here if you want to follow along. Would love to have you pull out your text in your phone or if you have a Bible with you. I'll be reading a lot of our text this morning, though. And this part of Exodus, the first couple chapters, you're going to see a pattern where essentially in the first opening section Tom taught last week, it's kind of zoomed out, right? It's zoomed out to a bit of the meta story. And then we're going to zoom in on these specific characters and experiences before zooming out once more to God's perspective on the situation. But we're going to begin in Exodus. And if you remember, in the first 14 verses that Tom took us through, we got a little bit of the backstory. So we know from those first verses some things. We know that the Egyptian and the Hebrew people have enjoyed a time of relative peace, but now, as there's been a shift in leadership, the Hebrews are becoming a perceived threat to the powers, the ruling powers in Egypt. There's tension over rising population growth, which interestingly is actually part of the promise God made to the people, right? That they'd be a a numerous, plentiful nation outnumbering the stars. Um, And that they would somehow be a nation someday and have a group identity too. And that part's coming. But they're growing, they're multiplying, and this is causing tension. They are a perceived threat. And we see that in verse 10 when Pharaoh says, Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave this country. So there's a couple threats that they're perceiving. One, of course, is simply a threat of them leaving, right? They're part of the economic powerhouse of the land, but more so they're worried that if another empire rises up against Egypt that these people will join the revolt, which probably is an indicator that they have not been well treated already as ethnic minorities, right? If it's assumed they'll join the other side and rise up against them. So what do they do? In this place of feeling threatened, they choose to exert even more control, to oppress and control, right? So it says in 11, they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. But it doesn't work. And it says, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites, in verse 12, to dread them, to fear them. And fear is a bad master. And fear will drive them to even more heinous plans that we're going to read about. And as those evil plans unfold, it leads us to zoom in and meet some of these unlikely partners who will work with God in the unfolding drama of the Exodus. These unlikely partners who will play a key role in seeing the freeing, the liberation of the Hebrew people. So when you think of the book of Exodus, the story of Exodus, if you've read it before or studied it in community, who is the person, the biblical figure that you think of? Moses. Right. We think of Moses, which makes sense. It's a Moses story, right? It's a Red Sea story. It's a Moses feature. He, he is indeed, he's the protagonist. He's kind of the leading character. But It's interesting because while we we do know a ton about Moses, we know more about Moses from birth to death than maybe almost any person in the biblical narrative. And he is incredible. I actually, um, one more prop here. 
I have an action figure of Moses. Oh, he lost his Ten Commandments. They're somewhere in my bag. Um, here they are. They're detachable because, you know, they fall off and break, and then he remakes them. It's very lifelike. So I have a little Moses action figure. I think I got it at an university conference, a leadership conference. And so he's kind of hot stuff, and I agree. Moses is amazing. And we're going to get to Moses. But um, really, he, he is an unlikely partner, for sure. But there's all these other incredible players in the story that I want you to meet. So let's go on in our text a little bit further and keep going in the second half of chapter one. All right, we're gonna pick it up in 15. The story continues. The king of Egypt says to the Hebrew midwives whose names were Shipra and Pua. Repeat that with me, Shipra and Pua. Pharaoh says, when you're helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, they feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt, after some time, summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why did you let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, well, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous. They give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. And then, because one plan fails, he doubles down, and Pharaoh gives this order to all his people saying, every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Uh, It's easy to gloss over parts of the story, but it is deeply troubling when you really think about what's happening. Uh, So when Pharaoh's attempts to control a people through oppression, slavery, forced labor does not work. He resorts to what we would call infanticide, the murder of infants. And in this case, specifically, the murder of males. Um, the word is andro side. It's horrific. It uses fear to control and violence. It's also short-sighted, right? Not just taking care of a future military threat, but wiping out people groups, and it's not just an ancient world problem. In the 20th century, there are numerous examples of androcide. As recently as in the late 90s, the murder of young Albanian men in Serbia, in the Kosovo War, in the Bosnian War, in Rwanda, uh, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia in the late 70s, murdered somewhere they estimate between 50 and 70 percent of working age men. It is not just an ancient world problem. And Pharaoh's strategy is to call these women, these Hebrew midwives, likely the leaders of all of the midwives for the Hebrews, Shipra and Pua, and says, kill the male children. And the text tells us that at great cost to themselves, and perhaps in one of the earliest recorded incidents of civil disobedience, they say no. They fear God more than they fear Pharaoh, and they defy this order. And he calls them back, right? And they give this very clever retort, right? And I look at these women, and I, I mean, Moses is great, but I want a Shipra and Pua action figure to complete my set because there wouldn't be a Moses without them, right? Their act of civil disobedience, their courageous act, changed the course of human history, and we hardly know their names. And look at, let's keep going. There's other incredibly brave women in this story, unlikely partners that we're going to meet in chapter two. So let's keep going. Chapter two, 
continuing on, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, go figure, babies are not easy to hide. Um, she could hide him no longer. She gets a papyrus basket for him, coats it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Interestingly enough, she in some ways obeys the letter of the law in that she puts her male child in the Nile. But she gives him a chance to live. Verse 4, his sister, the baby's sister, this might be Miriam, who's named later, right? Stood at a distance to see what would happen. And over here, Pharaoh's daughter, the daughter of the king, is down at the Nile bathing with her attendants. They're walking along the riverbank, and it says she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opens it and sees the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then, also a very brave act, the baby's sister approaches Pharaoh's daughter and says, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? And it sets up this moment where now they're at a crossroads. Pharaoh's daughter has to decide, will I defy my father and choose compassion? And in what must have felt like such a long moment, finally she says, yes, go. So the girl goes and gets the baby's mother, and then Pharaoh's daughter says to the baby's mother, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Isn't it? It's so incredible. You know, the mother releases the child, and not only does the child come back to her, to be nursed, but she gets compensated for it when all of the women and the men are enslaved and unpaid. She gets paid. Time passes, verse 10, it says the child grew older. Whew. And what must have been an incredibly difficult moment, she takes him to Pharaoh's daughter and he becomes her son. And Pharaoh's daughter names the child Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. The, the word Moses sounds like the Hebrew word for draw out. Moses has come onto the scene. The whole thing is pretty hard to imagine. This is one of those, we teach this to kids on a felt board or in, in one dimension or video, and you're like, oh. When you actually let yourself imagine, it's the emotion and the desperation and the heart-wrenching choices that each of these people had to make in this scene. It's almost overwhelming. But all of these women, young and old, they make incredible, courageous choices. And they do the right thing, even when it's hard, when it costs them, when it could cost them everything. And I think sometimes, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in the little things, the everyday imperfections of life, focusing on what's the right way to do things, blue tape, toothpaste, whatever else. And I wonder if we get so caught up that we are worried so much about the right way to do things that we miss the right thing to do that might be right in front of us. These women are unlikely heroes, unlikely partners in God's rescue mission. And we're going to see that Moses, he's going to have a hard time living up to this legacy. And he's going to have to grow into it. Because he does not show up particularly well when we come back to him as an adult in the story. So let's go to the next part in chapter 2. Moses is grown up. This is verse 11. It says he's grown up, he's an adult now, and he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he kills the Egyptian. 
and he hides him in the sand. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, in an ironic foreshadowing of what would come, well, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. And it had. And it gets back to Pharaoh. And when Pharaoh heard of this, verse 15, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. He went 300 miles across the Sinai Peninsula southeast to get away from this, to flee. And he sits down by a well. So we're in this whole new context, right? The Midianite would have been a Hebraic people descended from Abraham, but not a a part of kind of the covenant people per se. They were a nomadic, shepherding people. So Moses is way over here hiding out. And the text tells us that he now meets a new community. There's a priest of Midian who had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Verse 17, some shepherds, some scallywag shepherds, they come along, they drive um, them away, but Moses gets up and intervenes, right? He comes to their rescue and waters the flock. When the girls return to Ruel, their father, later we'll know him as Jethro, he asks them, why have you returned so early? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, and he even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Well, why did you leave him? Invite him here to have something to eat. Also a gutsy act for a Midianite and an Egyptian. So Moses stays with them. The man gives his daughter Zipporah in marriage. Zipporah gives birth to a son, and Moses names him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. So that is our story, our introduction to all grown-up Moses. And it's not an auspicious beginning. There's a few things we're going to start to see about the person of Moses um, developing, right? First of all, Moses has significant identity issues that he's working through, right? And this would have been confusing. He's a Hebrew, so he's ethnically Hebrew, right? We heard it twice that he said he related to his own people, the enslaved Hebrews, but he's culturally Egyptian. He's been raised with the customs, the grooming, the dress, the physical experience as an Egyptian, right? The Midianite family, they see him and think he's Egyptian. So he's got this bicultural upbringing that's causing this tension. He's probably got abandonment issues from his birth family. His adoptive grandfather tries to kill him. There is a lot he's working through in his identity. He's kind of a hot mess. And he has this kind of emotional, uh, unregulated intensity that you see in the story, too, which makes total sense. And then you add to that, what you can see is this pattern of a deep sense of um, response to injustice, right? What is right and wrong, what's just and unjust, that comes out uh, in unhelpful ways, right? Um, in dangerous ways, and then in better ways later in the story, right? We see this pattern, but ultimately, Moses is lost and unanchored and confused. He doesn't belong anywhere. He doesn't know who he is. He has no home. It's not Egypt. It's not with the Hebrews. It's not in Midianite, and his poor son gets named, I'm a foreigner in a foreign land. I mean, talk about working out your issues on your kids. Well, let's avoid that one. He is lost. And at this point, he is not action figure material. Not even close, right? He's an unlikely partner with God. So how is this guy going to become a key player in God's epic liberation story? There's a cool little thing that that we see when you look at some of the, the word use. Uh, and the word play in the book of Exodus, and one of them is actually on Moses' name. So remember, his name um, sounds like the Hebrew word to draw out, right? Because they drew him out of the water. And you might have heard it in the Midianite women's story, right, where he actually draws water out for the women and the sheep. So Moses is drawn out of the water. He himself is rescued, 
And then in fear, he is actually drawn out of his homeland into the wilderness where he's going to encounter God in a profound way and find his purpose. And just as he draws water out for the Midianite women to be a part of their rescue, God is going to draw these amazing things out of Moses' leadership and character in order to be a part of the drawing out of a whole people into freedom. And if this guy can be a player in God's big purposes, why not you? Do you disqualify yourself some kind because of things in your past or your own imperfections? Because I wonder what in this season might the Lord be drawing out of you in order to draw others into life giving freedom in Jesus. No matter how unlikely, you have a part to play in God's larger purposes. You have a part to play. We have a part to play, no matter how unlikely. And so zoom out with me for a second, just to the very end of this text. Because God's perspective in 23, it says, during that long period when Moses is in wilderness, the king of Egypt dies and the Israelites groan in their slavery and cry out for help. Because of their slavery, it goes up to God. It says God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. It's about to happen. So worship team, come on up as we prepare to respond. But you, do you feel the drama in that moment? Right, The stage is set. God has heard. He's remembered his promises. His gaze is on them, and his compassion is stirred. The time has come. God is on the move. And we, too, get to be a part of this. We have a part to play. And so my challenge to us this week is to think about all these unlikely players and characters in this story of the Exodus so far. And my challenge is that this week is would you do the right thing, even if it's hard? So I, who knows the moments that will present themselves, but maybe, you know, don't join in some unkind talk or gossip this week. Maybe choose integrity. If you're a student or in your work, choose integrity when you're tempted to take a shortcut or cheat, right? Leave the AI off to the side. Stand up for someone this week that's being mistreated. Forgive someone when they don't deserve it. Will you do a hard thing, even just one hard thing this week when it's the right thing to do? Be a shipra, be a pua, and it makes a difference. It does, it makes a huge difference. Sometimes we think that's just one thing or I'm one person, but it matters. And I wanna give you, end with just a little auditory um, it exercise about how this matters. So I want you to hold up one finger. You're one person, right? You're one brave choice this week to do the right thing when it's hard. You and maybe there's one other person. Hold up another finger and just start to tap those fingers together. We think, well, that, that doesn't do much, right? But what about if it's two? What about two people, right? What if three of us actually decided to start doing something? What if four people right, said, I'm going to do the right thing, even with heart. What if all five of us actually did something, right? It matters. So let me pray for us as we end. God, would you teach us to be courageous like these men and women who did the right thing when it was hard? Would you teach us to believe that you know us, you call us, and in all our imperfections, we were made to be a part of your great story. We were made for the more you have, for the big plans of setting people free. Would you teach us to worship you and to hear your invitations to us in this time of response? Amen.